January 4th, 2023. A seasoned pilot takes off from St. George, Utah, flying a familiar route in his high-tech twin-engine Piper Seneca. No distress calls, no system failures. Just 17 minutes later, his aircraft is found wrecked in the mountains near New Harmony, completely destroyed. What happened? The NTSB's final report is out, and the answer isn't just tragic, it's deeply frustrating. Because this crash wasn't caused by some mechanical fluke or unpredictable weather. It wasn't about equipment failure, it was about trust, and how one pilot put too much of it in the wrong things. Here's what happened. Now let's start by talking about the pilot himself. This wasn't some weekend warrior hopping into a rented Cessna. Fred W. Jones was 70 years old and had over 2,600 hours of flight time, 2,000 of those in the very plane he was flying. A Piper P A 34220T Seneca 5. That's a serious twin-engine aircraft. He knew it inside and out, and this wasn't his first Seneca either. It was his third. The aircraft was also not your average light twin. It came fully loaded with a Garmin G 1000 glass cockpit, which includes digital displays, synthetic vision, terrain warnings, and a GFC 700 autopilot system that can level the aircraft automatically if things go wrong. There was even a backup display system, an Aspen EFD-1000, plus certified ice protection. So this plane was equipped to handle weather, terrain, and automation support well beyond basic VFR flying. According to his daughter, who was also a pilot, Fred was meticulous about pre-flight planning. He always used the autopilot. He knew the route. He knew the airplane. So how does a guy like that crash a plane into rising terrain just minutes after departure? Well, that's where things start getting uncomfortable because this accident wasn't about lack of experience or lack of tools. It was about how he used them. So here's where the trouble starts. Fred made the decision to take off VFR. That's visual flight rules, flying by sight. Even though a significant portion of his route right past the airport was obscured by clouds and low visibility. And I'm not talking about a surprise weather system here. According to the NTSB, the pass north of the airport, the only realistic way through the mountainous terrain was visibly socked in. You could see the clouds from the airport ramp. Other pilots did. One even canceled his flight and drove instead. Now here's what's really crazy. Fred did check the weather. He used ForeFlight, which showed him not only surface conditions, but turbulence forecasts, freezing levels, and more. He looked at all that just 20 minutes before departure, and on top of that, he had flown this exact route many times. He knew the pass. He could have easily predicted what flying into that obscuration would lead to. And yes, I get it. Conditions at the departure and destination airports were still reported as VMC, meaning technically flyable under visual rules. But the pass in between? That was the bottleneck. That was the trap. And here's the real kicker. There was no urgency. He wasn't in a rush. He wasn't trying to beat a business deadline. The only thing on the horizon was a vacation he had next week. So this wasn't a case of pressure. It was a case of overconfidence. Overconfidence in his familiarity with the route. Overconfidence in the plane. Overconfidence in himself. But don't get me wrong, that wasn't even his biggest mistake. Flying into marginal conditions isn't uncommon in GA, and unfortunately, it doesn't always end in tragedy. But what Fred did next, that's where things really unraveled. Because he didn't just try to sneak through the pass, he relied on technology to do it for him. And that's where things turned deadly. Now here's where things really take a frustrating turn. After departure, Fred didn't follow his usual path through the pass. Instead, he turned northeast, straight toward rising terrain, and likely right into the cloud layer that had been sitting over the mountains all day. This wasn't just a small deviation. This was a deliberate course change into known instrument conditions without any IFR clearance, and more importantly, without declaring any sort of emergency or requesting ATC help. That's a huge red flag. But what really made this situation dangerous 
is how he chose to navigate inside the soup. Instead of flying using a proper instrument procedure, Fred began issuing small heading changes through the autopilot's HDG mode. Essentially, he was manually steering the plane through the terrain, in the clouds, using the map display and synthetic vision as a kind of virtual window. Now synthetic vision, if you're not familiar, is a feature on the Garmin G1000 that creates a digital 3D view of the terrain based on GPS and database information. It looks like a flight simulator and can make you feel like you're flying visually, even in total cloud. But here's the thing. It's not certified for primary navigation in IMC. It's an aid, not a substitute for real IFR flying. It's there to enhance situational awareness, not to fly the airplane through mountain passes blind. At some point, that synthetic terrain alert system likely went off. Fred responded by adding power and initiating a climbing turn, probably trying to outclimb the terrain ahead. But by then, it was too late. The maneuver that followed wasn't precise or calculated. It was desperate. And just like that, the automation advantage became a liability. This was the second massive mistake. He used the tools, sure, but he used them in exactly the wrong context. And that's something we don't talk about enough. Automation doesn't fix poor decisions. It just enables them to play out further. Now here's the part of the story that hits hard and feels deeply unfair, because this next phase is less about judgment and more about physiology. The final data showed the aircraft beginning erratic pitch and bank movements, rolling into a tight left-hand spiral with wild swings in altitude and heading. This wasn't turbulence. This was spatial disorientation in its rawest, deadliest form. And if you've never flown in IMC without strong instrument skills, let me put it like this. Your inner ear lies to you. Your brain can't tell up from down. In just two to three minutes, you can feel completely in control while actually putting your airplane into a death spiral. That's not a figure of speech. That's literally what happens. About 40 seconds before impact, Fred hit the LVL button, the emergency level mode, on the autopilot. It's designed to immediately right the aircraft, wings level, zero vertical speed. And according to the data, the autopilot actually tried to respond, but the inputs continued. The airplane kept descending. It kept rolling. And here's the sad truth. He likely overpowered the autopilot manually through the controls, maybe without even realizing it. When the aircraft struck the mountain, it was in a steep, nose-down, left-wing low attitude. Both engines were still producing power. The plane was flying, but the pilot wasn't in control. This was the third and final mistake, and it wasn't a knowledge issue. It was likely a proficiency issue. There's no evidence that Fred had recent experience flying by hand in instrument conditions, and the ability to hand fly in IMC? That's not something you just remember. It's a muscle. It fades. And in moments like this, it's the one thing that matters most. Here's the part that really hits home, because Fred had everything he needed to survive this flight. He had an aircraft with synthetic vision, terrain warning, a smart autopilot, decent equipment, and even backup displays. He was instrument rated. He'd flown this route many times, and yet none of it saved him. Why? Because those tools only work if your decisions align with reality. Fred made three critical errors. First, he flew VFR into terrain he could clearly see was covered in cloud. Second, he used visual style navigation tools inside non-visual conditions. And third, he couldn't or wasn't prepared to take manual control when everything started to fall apart. And this is the broader takeaway here. Technology doesn't replace judgment. All those tools in the cockpit, they can only work with you. They don't cancel out mistakes. In fact, they can sometimes delay the consequences, just enough for those mistakes to become fatal. Modern general aviation is filled with high-tech aircraft, but we need to stop pretending that cockpit automation equals safety. It doesn't. It buys you time. It gives you options. But in the end, it's your decision-making, your planning, your stick-and-rudder skills that matter most. And in Fred's case, the tech wasn't the failure. 
It was the misplaced faith in it. So here's what this really comes down to. This wasn't an unqualified pilot. This wasn't a faulty aircraft. This was a deeply preventable crash caused by misplaced confidence in automation, in familiarity, in personal skill. Fred Jones had every advantage, but he made one reckless decision at the worst possible time, and that unraveled everything. Because in aviation, the biggest threat isn't weather or terrain or technology. The biggest threat is hubris. If you're a pilot, ask yourself, when was the last time you practiced real instrument flying? Could you hand fly your plane in IMC if your autopilot failed? Would you really cancel if the pass looked bad? Or would you press on? That's the call to action today. Know your limits. Respect the weather. And never confuse tools for training. Because when the clouds close in and the mountains rise, the one thing that matters most is you.